session which uh, I have been looking forward to for a long time. These are some of my best friends and these are some of the finest, finest cricket writers you'll ever see. Uh, I don't know if in, in, in this lineup I probably need more introduction than anybody else, uh, but one has to, for the sake of form, at the, at the extreme, to my extreme left, your extreme right is Gideon Haig, who is the who is the head of my profession, the finest cricket writer in the world today. Uh, Mike Brearley, who really needs even less introduction, is the greatest cricket captain this this world has seen. And then we have Amrit Mathur, who is a cricket administrator, a cricket writer, and has some of the deepest insights into IPL that you will ever read or hear about. And then Sharda, who of course is our local girl, and, a, and among the finest anywhere in the world. I start with you, Mike, because this is a popular request since we spoke yesterday. The popular request is, please ask Mr. Mike Brearley to tell us why India lost the World Cup. Can you hear me now? Um, it's a touchy subject if I, as an elderly ex-captain, talk about current, a current captaincy or strategy thing in cricket. It's especially a problem if I, as an Englishman, talk about an Indian situation. Um, I don't want you to think that, as somebody said of, of Gideon yesterday, that he's been he wasn't content with ruling cricket for 200 years, uh, but he comes to India and criticizes Indian cricket. Anyway, that's getting me off the hook. Now, I dare say many of you watched the World Cup final, and I watched um, quite a lot of it. I watched the first seven wickets of India and the last um, no wickets of Australia. And... Um, I thought India were playing really well. I thought Rohit Sharma played very well. I thought um, Subram Gill played well until he got out. I thought Kohli and Rahul rescued the operation pretty well. And various things happened, partly through luck, partly through skill of Australia. And, um, you know, they only got 240. And that last part and the best, first part of the Australian innings, we were at a family lunch and I missed it. So I came back soon after Australia were 47 for three. And it was a match really which had turned, in my mind, from being a limited overs match to being like a test match or a time cricket match. Because the only issue was, could India bowl Australia out? There was no, going to be no shortage of overs or balls to score the runs in if they stayed in. So it seemed to me that soon after 47 for three, India were in a good position. And there was Travis Head beginning to play dangerously. And there was Manus Labuschagne, almost left out of the team for the match, on bad form, a batsman who likes to score a lot of singles early in his innings. And it seemed to me that India gave him a run a ball. They gave him a single to mid-off, a single to long on, single to square leg and a single to cover, which was exactly what he would like to find his rhythm a little bit and to get back into form and exactly what Travis Head would like because he'd then get the strike, which is the last thing India wanted. And it seems to me that captains don't often enough think of what it is that the opposition least want. And I thought that it went flat then because India weren't putting pressure on Australia to get these wickets. They were waiting for them to make a mistake, which they made few of and got away with when they did. 
So that was my thought about. And when I, the other thing I wanted to say though is that when I told this, what I've just said to you, to some friends in Ahmedabad who had been at the match and who were, uh, one might even say, to quote Ram last night, Ram Chandra Guha last night, what was the phrase, the, the big phrase at the beginning? Cult personality. It might even have um, been that I was criticizing a cult personality in India. India. There was a deadly silence. <laughs> Nobody agreed or disagreed. It was as if I'd said something shocking. So I thought we might start like that. <laughs> Well, I think, I think the Indian team seemed to think that India would win. The, the rest of India certainly seemed to think so. And there was a whole, whole uh, strong feeling of nationalism or jingoism. And it had, been, it had continued through the period of the World Cup, which brings me to uh, a question for Gideon. How has this become so intense and how was it what, what is the next sort of logical progression of this kind of nationalism? Well, I mean, we often think of nationalism in terms of uh, country versus country, don't we? But, uh, but I often hark back to um, uh, the World Cup of 2007, where, if you recall, and probably most people here do, India failed to get beyond the, uh, the group stages. And I think Indian broadcast media and England, Indian commercial organisations had invested very heavily in India repeating its success in the 2003 World Cup. And they were profoundly disillusioned by, by Indians' failure under the captaincy of, of Rahul Dravid. And India seemed en masse to switch off at that point in the tournament turning it into a commercial disaster for, uh, for people who'd gone out so far on a limb to expect India to go through. And one of the interesting uh, corollaries or consequences, I think, of that World Cup was uh, th this, is the, this is the period in which the first thoughts are being had of the Indian Premier League. You know, Lalit Modi is, uh, is going around about the place talking about the possibility of a, of a metropolitan T20 league in, uh, in India. And of course, India then proceed to win the, uh, the T20 World Cup in South Africa. But one of the things that the IPL was designed to achieve was to create a species of cricket in which India always win that you'll be guaranteed an Indian quotient for the duration of the tournament. And in some ways, it's, a, it's, it's no accident that that happened uh, in the aftermath of 2007. People that had their fingers burned by the glorious uncertainty of cricket, what they wanted was inglorious certainty and commercial certainty. And that, of course, has been one of the great strengths of the, uh, of the IPL. So even though we think of it as primarily a club versus club or, or, or a domestic tournament, it is actually, I think, the apotheosis of, of cricketing nationalism, a tournament in which only one country can win. That's wonderful. Uh, I'd like to check with uh, Amrit Mathur. Amrit, Amrit and I uh, travelled to South Africa together in 1992 on the first uh, Indian tour of South Africa. I was a reporter, Amrit was the manager of the Indian team, and uh, he's, he's, he's in a lovely position to tell us how touring has changed in this, in this period. Because I remember on that tour, I think we had, we had, apart from the players, we had, I think, three others. There was a manager, there was a coach, and there was that guy who ran around cutting players' hair and getting them coffee and stuff like that. I'm sure, I'm sure he was very good at it, but this is, the, this is how professional we were. So tell us how, how, how touring has changed. Uh, thanks, Suresh. Uh, touring has changed. I first toured with the Indian team in 1992, as you mentioned. And uh, there was something special about that tour. We were going to South Africa, a country we did not recognize, we had no relations with. And our passports were marked not to travel to Israel and South Africa. But despite all that, we went. We went to South Africa without any preparation. There was no camp. We arrived in Bombay, 
collected our clothes and whatever you know, documents and off. In fact, in the first team meeting, one of the players asked, who's Kepler Vessels? You know, that showed what kind of knowledge or information we had about South Africa. Kepler had already played for Australia, made a test 100, was captain of South Africa. So one aspect of this tour was complete lack of preparation or information. We knew nothing about South Africa, the pitches, the players, the conditions. The other thing was that uh, the size of the squad, as you mentioned, we were a total of 17, 14 players, Ajit Vadika, the coach, I was the manager, and Dr. Ali Irani, somebody you mentioned, who did everything else. <laughs> so, because of being just 17, I and Ali would help with the fielding drills. And there was nobody else to do uh, whatever was required for the team. Compare that to now. The Indian team travels a minimum of 20 to 22 players, because you have a team which is of 15, you have net bowlers, you have traveling reserves. In addition to these 22, you have almost around 20 people who are support staff. So you have throwdown experts, you've got masseos, physios, uh, yoga teacher, mental health uh, expert, uh, chef, there is a, a data guy, there is a media person, there is a marketing guy, you name it. So as a result, whatever the manager was supposed to do on tours earlier is now, is now done by a specialist who is specially there with the team. So the manager's role is diminished. He has nothing to do. All he has to do actually is to wear a tie, look busy, and arrange for passes for the players' wives. <laughs> so you might as well not have a manager on the tour. The only time where he could be required is in a, say, inquiry held by the match referee. But I'm sure the coach or the captain can stand in. So I think a lot has changed on tours, and certainly everything now is pre-decided. When you went to South Africa, the playing conditions were not done. We were told, go and settle it. So we settled on you know, playing conditions like the television coming to decide the line decisions. And we had Sachin as the first person to be declared out following that. The point is nobody had any preparation. We were just told, kar lena jaake, baat kar lena. Whether it's playing conditions or about the commercial arrangements of the tour or the social commitments on the tour by the team, media interactions, wherever. So, what has changed? Everything more professional, you know, maybe more complicated now. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a bit depressing to realize that this is fairly recently, recent. It, we were talking about 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, we were, we were sort of rank amateurs when it came to such things. Yeah. One of the things that has changed in that period, one of the things that changed in that period, of course, is the control of the Board of Control for Cricket in India, which slowly over a period assumed total power in this unipolar world. And uh, I come to Sharda now who has written a magnificent piece on the BCCI and its many ways in, in the caravan recently. Uh, I won't ask you how BCCI has changed because they haven't changed. It's, it's, the change is not, a, I think, a change in, in, in uh, kind, it's a change in degree. They were always a very powerful and a very sort of uh, feudal organization. It's become more powerful and more feudal. And, and where does that leave Indian cricket? Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, uh, Suresh. Uh, Indian cricket is in a position now where it can fundamentally decide how the rest of the cricket world functions. Uh, because the rest of the cricket world depends on them, uh, and because they are happy to boast that the rest of the world cricket depends on them and there's no pushback from anybody else uh, to say that, look, there's another way of playing, of organizing the international game uh, that is not centered around Indian uh, advertising and uh, Indian television rights and uh, money and so on. Um, what that has happened is that it's almost made the ICC an invisible organization. Uh, people who worked in the World Cup, uh, they tell me that the ICC, was, it's like the ICC was not there because it was an ICC event, they were running it, they had people on the ground, but the decisions were being taken outside their 
ambit like it was just happening the way it was supposed to be happening we all read the story about uh, uh, the change of the pitch at the semi final and so on and i think india's presence uh, has gone from being the kind of we are the leaders of the asian block there used to be an asian block in the 1990s uh, that was um, jagu darmaya's creation uh, so that's india pakistan sri lanka bangladesh and the associate countries so we are that each of them had votes in the icc and that was the group that was led by the bcci now that asian block is not part the asian block the, uh, the bcci pretends that it is the emperor of um the sport uh, that they are the ruling masters and there is no sense of professionalism or uh, um almost uh, uh, like statesman it's not statesman like it this is basically almost like uh, it, it it's a functioning dictatorship in the international game so everybody knows how uh, the icc is going to pan out over the next few years who's going to be in charge who's going to be in the finance committee how the money is going to move around and when you're seeing that happen uh, the thing to fear is what is the international go game going to be like say uh, 10 15 years from now um, what will be left of uh, bilateral tour so someone I'll, very quickly someone i talked to said listen australia and uh, michael holding uh, said australia and england will always play the ashes uh, india and australia will always play border gavaskar but the rest of the game uh, the international game will just dilute and if uh, 2020 cricket grows like the way we think it's growing uh, the sky is falling like i keep saying <laughs> well the sky is falling and 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 we better watch out there is a there is a there are certain things that the bcci are, are doing right and one of those things i think i i i wonder if you agree with me is in the handling of women's cricket because they have they have uh, taken on the responsibility of uh, being the uh, of administering the game there are a whole lot of issues that yeah. uh, they have also had which indian cricket the, the men's cricket has have had at the start of uh, uh, the bci in the early years a similar kind of problem seem to be again uh, coming out here but by and large i mean we don't expect perfection but by and large they seem to be handling women's cricket well is that is that fair to say that's a fair thing to say uh, if you're going uh, on the period of what's happened in the last 7 years now i don't know sound like some grumbling person always saying this but uh, bcci took over women's cricket in about 2006 and the women were given their first contract in about i think 2014 or 15 is the time it so you're talking about 10 years where there was no interest taken in women's cricket that's at least a generation if not two generations of women players whose careers just came and went um what the bcci does very well other than organizing 2000 or 1000 plus matches every year and they have a team of more than 100 people doing it who do a very good job what they do very well is they take public attention or public attention is on the men's national team the ipl and now the women's national team and all, all that all our attention as media is focused on these three elements and the rest of it goes on as it is so the good thing is that the women's national team has become a part of it the women's uh, premier league the women's 2020 tournament international league is also there um, and we'll see what they do with that Uh, with with the women's game how they allow say the women cricketers to play will they allow them to play in other uh, 2020 tournaments like they 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 don't allow the men so uh, when you answer those questions when those questions are answers we'll see which way the the sport is going to go another thing that will tell us which way the sport is going to go is possibly the IPL and uh, nobody quite knows exactly which way the wind will blow but i think uh, amrit uh, you have a pretty good idea you've written about it recently you've written about the hardik pandya case where where he he shifted from gujarat to bombay and uh, i'd like to hear your your thoughts on this please i think suresh before we go into the so details of the pandya shift just two three points the ipl is structural certain principles one everything will be decided by the market the price you pay to buy a team the players in the auction process so it's a market commercial driven you know system secondly it's a closed league the 10 teams stay their security there's no up down relegation exit etc it's like telling a batsman you play you won't be dismissed and you are assured profits so the third part of the ipl was that as there is security you also want competition 
So all teams are supposedly equal in terms of putting resources in to make the squad. So you have a salary cap, you have 100 crores available to everybody. Now this is where the contradiction starts. You say all teams are equal and it's a level playing field of 100 crores, but you also create ways for teams to go beyond those 100 crores. Now whether it's in form of the cost of support staff, whether it's in terms of the negotiated contracts at retention, or as in Pandya's case, the money paid beyond 100 crores to transfer a player. So it's strange. You want everybody to be equal, but you also created you know, ways for teams not to be equal. So this is what has been highlighted by the Pandya case. Now, it is, I think, a defining moment in terms of the IPL, because this is the first instance of a top player saying, I'm leaving. I'm leaving because I want more money and I'm getting more money. Till now, the teams have control over a player. Now, here is a big star. And this will hold only for five or seven main stars. It won't apply to others. Now, it has opened the door for them in terms of asserting their power and in terms of negotiating transfers and contracts, which will go much, much beyond the auction price. Now, somebody like Virat or Brohit or somebody as big in the future will start negotiating, not keeping that 100 crore per, you know, as a reference point. He will start looking at the profit the team is making. So if you're making X amount of profit, let's talk on the basis of that. So I think this is a major turning point in terms of how the players are going to go uh, forward in terms of contracts. It also asserts and tells us about the power of the big player. Now the power of the big player is only for Indian batsmen. It doesn't even apply to Indian bowlers. You know, that's how it is in terms of the commercial pull and the, the power that he may enjoy. But uh, the top players, I think, would be very happy at this development because when it comes to the next auction or the transfer or the retention, they've got much, much more money to look forward to. And as I said somewhere else, it's not far-fetched for somebody to make 50 crores a year from the IPL. 50 crores a year for, what, six weeks' work? That's, that's yeah, interesting. But listen, this will only apply to few and only to Indian players. The reality is, in the IPL's commercial structure, a foreign player doesn't matter commercially. Yeah. You might pay Stokes 18 crores or Sam Curran 16 or somebody 17, but that's because of the desperation of the team in terms of the balance. It's not because of the commercial power of that player. Yeah. I don't think a foreign player sells a ticket. He doesn't get you an extra rupee from the sponsor. That's reality. So where do we go from here, Gideon? Kingsley Amos said about English universities, more will mean worse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually interested to hear what Amrit's got to say there. Um, because I've always thought, despite the, uh, the, the, the eye-watering telephone book sums that are paid to cricketers in the IPL, that they're, as a proportion of the overall revenues, they're not paid all that well. As a, you know, we, we, have a, we have a profit share or revenue share arrangement for Australian cricketers in Australia. But if you look at the amount of money that is made off Indian cricketers, they are comparatively not well rewarded, at least by the game, because I guess they make most of their money outside of the game. You know, Gideon, we, ha we also have a system of um, sharing of revenue in India, but the IPL is outside that. Yes. So yep. the IPL money is not shared with the players. Yes. The normal bilateral uh, uh, series and other income of the board, there mm. is a certain percentage of the 26 yep. which is shared with the players. But yep. the IPL is outside that uh, arrangement. Well, I guess the one thing that you can bet on, Suresh, is that the rich will get richer and the poor will have to do the best they can with the crumbs from the rich man's table. And that goes for countries as well as players. Uh, it's, it's ironic that you know, cricket has never been richer and yet in more, more countries around the world it's never been comparatively poorer. True. Which means you, we, we're going to have three or four or half a dozen countries up there. I think you've already got that, don't you? And, and, yeah. and, yes, and, and, yeah. then, and, then, and then the rest just make yes. up the numbers. I think or, just three, just three, not yeah. half a dozen. Yeah, that's true, just three. No, but, yeah, comparatively speaking, with, with the 122nd country or whatever. You could even argue that India won the World Cup. So they made more money than anybody else. They took 38 out of every $100 that the World Cup generated. So, viva India. <laughs>
Well, that's a thought. But there, there are other things that the IPL is changing. For example, uh, the, the importance of uh, data, the importance of the coaching, the importance of the person sitting in, in the dugout and deciding how, how the play should go. And, and uh, you were telling me recently about how there's a, there's a sort of a blackboard, or, well, I don't know if it's a blackboard or an electronic board, where, where the uh, coach points to various numbers. First number might be uh, bring fine leg shorter. The second number might be it's time to bring on the left arm spinner, etc., etc. And then and then he points to one of those, and, and the captain is obliged to follow those instructions. So the, my my question to you, Mike, is in this sort of scenario, uh, cricket doesn't need a manager anymore. Cricket doesn't need a guy who cuts hair. Where does a captain? One, one what, second. One second, Suresh. Can I uh, add to the questions which Mike can respond to? In the IPL, there's a captain, but breathing down his neck are various other people. There's a mentor, there's a coach, uh, there's the owner, and there's a data guy. So all of them are, have, are in position of authority, and as a result, the captain's role gets you know, pushed to the background a bit. So the question to Mike would be, as a captain, not just of England, but also Middlesex for 11 years, how would you react uh, to a situation like this where your, you had all these people surrounding you when it came to cricket decisions? I, I think I want to start as a slight, I'll come back to that, I think. When I was, for, for 12, 12, 11 or 12 years, I was on and then the chairman of MCC's World Cricket Committee, which was, had players from previous generations from all over the world, and it was a think tank on international cricket really and top level cricket and one of the great things about it was we didn't have to worry about the money the money questions I know the money questions are crucial but the trouble is that one start, stops talking about cricket and you know it even it happens at committee meetings it happens here even now and you know it becomes the most important thing and that's the, that's a troubling thing in itself to my mind I want to talk about the cricket, and I can't really. And I mean, as we were coming in, uh, somebody said to me, um, is the theme of our topic, the sky's falling in? <laughs> that was Sharda. And I said, you mean we might never see another Jeff boycott? And <laughs> anyway, we might, but never. But, but I want to say about short cricket, 2020 and one day cricket, which are both very different from each other but also very different from four or five or three day cricket. Um, and I think I, I like all the forms of cricket, but I'm so worried that the shorter forms are pushing out test and top class cricket, even red ball cricket, as you said to me earlier. And um, it happens you know, partly through domestic leagues and partly through the IPL, as Amrit's been saying, I think. So I'm worried about that. that the, the, pin, the, the highest point of cricket um, is going to be lost or vastly reduced or turned into one-off matches or turned into three countries only playing. And people are going to be contracted to IPO clubs or their clubs in other countries are going to be owned by the IPL and people, the IPO will decide when somebody is available to play in a test match for their country. I'm worried about all that. I don't like it. I like the, the cricket itself. It's, it's made test cricket more interesting, actually. And Ben Stokes and um, Brendan McCullum could not have transformed or been transforming England cricket without one day cricketers in the background. And it's made a fantastic difference. But I'm worried about the way things are going. I don't know if the sky's going to fall in. Well, it's getting lower and lower. As, as R.K. Narayan wrote in, in one of his uh, books, he said, uh, in his diary actually, because people kept paying him, uh, saying that, uh, you know, they're paying him millions for his book, The Guide to be made into a movie. And he says the, the sum kept reducing. And he said, the sky, it, started by the, he, it was started by somebody who said, we, the sky is the limit. And then it kept reducing and reducing. And he said, it got so low, I could poke it with my umbrella. So, that's, 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 that's uh, some, some, something we've got to worry about. 
Are there other things we, we need to worry about, Gideon, in, in, in the manner uh, that cricket is reported nowadays, uh, where, where somehow, not you, not anybody on this panel, but uh, the, the, the reporters seem to be co-opted into the system uh, and the reporters' main job seems to be to sing hallelujahs of whoever is in power. If that goes far enough, is, is, there, is there a danger that things will not change over a period? Can I just say one thing? Yeah, and I haven't answered Amrit's question either, but I'll just say one thing about that. But one of the things that's very good about t television coverage, uh, I know the press coverage is more and more limited, and some of it's of the kind you just mentioned, but the test coverage is really good. I think it's better than it ever was. And the, and the experts who have played, I don't mean only players, but many of them are, I think do a really good job, at least on the TV I see mostly in England, a bit in India. But, uh, so I just wanted to say that. As for the captain's role, I would have been very fed up. <laughs> and, and very, uh, uh, you know, the, cricket's a thinking game. And it's, an, uh, it's a, a game where things change moment by moment. But you also, you get a feel of things on the field that's more difficult to get off the field. I'm not saying you can't. Of course you can. You do. You try and you think. But I think uh, the game where the captain's role becomes that of uh, uh, listening in the earphones or administering other people's pieces of advice or information seems to me a limited game. Well, as far as journalism is concerned, I mean, it's a, it's a second or third order priority. I mean, uh, who, who really cares about journalists in the end? We're just, we're just handmaidens, really. Um, we'll, but, uh, I mean, the fortunate position of never having written a T20 match report and it's probably too late for me now. I didn't do it voluntarily. I didn't say I will never report a T20 match. I just never got around to it. I never had the chance. You and me both, Gideon. And, and I think it is actually possible in the next generation for T20 match reports to be taken over by AI. It's absolutely, it's, they're, they're almost AI games. They might as well be written by AI journalists. So if you're looking to get into the, uh, into the profession of sports writing, that is not a place to target because you could very easily be mechanized out of existence. Can I just step in here, Suresh, uh, speaking about journalists, what has also happened is the mass profusion of the number of matches that there are, the number of matches due to largely 2020 leagues that seem relevant. Uh, that seems oh, very important and you have to write about it. There's the Legends League. So there's such a mass of information that basically AI seems to be the option and that, that's what people will go to. And that, the danger of that happening, uh, I'm really sounding like the most pessimistic person on the, in, in the whole space, is that um, you will take your eye off the ball of what you really need to look at, you know, because there's so much of work and hours of work that is going into putting out everything that looks perfect and your little uh, blurbs and your videos and whatever, that you'll take your eye off the ball of what the journalism can turn into. That's true. And I think that's worrying too. Uh, Suresh. Suresh. Yeah, I, sorry, um, sorry, Amrit. I just want to, you know, uh, flag some issues of the IPL. In India, we have about 3,000 players playing cricket at the senior level. And only 170 are in the IPL. So this huge bonus lottery of commercial money money with players is restricted to only 170 at the moment. Secondly, despite this, there is disinterest, maybe disrespect also towards red ball cricket. No youngster wants to play Ranji Trophy. His aim is only to somehow land an IPL contract. So this is something going forward, administrators have to sort of uh, sort out. At the international level, there is huge concern about IPL money going abroad and its effect. Already the leagues in uh, West Indies, South Africa, Dubai are owned by Indian team owners. And who knows when the Big Bash uh, Australia opens up the Big Bash or the 100, uh, they need money. Easiest way to make money is to sell the teams. And as soon as you open the door, it's the Indian team owners who are going to buy them out. So do you want that? Will you allow that? Is it good for your country? That's a question. Already we hear that Yorkshire is in, is in 
talks with an IPL team to buy out. So somehow, somewhere you'll have to sort these issues out and uh, also adjust to the reality that this IPL money which is running world cricket. Already players are willing to sacrifice or uh, not enter into contracts. You know, there have been many players who are refusing national contracts just to play the leagues. So where does it leave uh, bilateral cricket? Where does it leave the authorities running cricket in the respective countries? So I think IPL is a huge commercial success, but also many questions with it. That's true. I hope we have depressed you enough uh, this afternoon. Uh, we've got uh, five, six minutes for questions. So please, and, and please keep it short and uh, no, no long statements and uh, personal essays, please. Yeah, somebody in front can. So my question is, do you think that at some point the, the monopoly that the top three countries do have is not just for the money, but also to see that other countries that are playing cricket don't really develop as much so that they maintain that sort of monopoly? And what role do you see cricket's inclusion in the LA28 Olympics uh, in changing this particular stance at this particular point in time? You'll take that, Gideon? I don't think there's much point to be served in talking about a top three. You know, it's a top one, and there's two others, and then there's the rest. Uh, sorry. So, um, yeah, uh, it's... Well, it was, it was the big three. Uh, I think the big three have, have, uh, have experienced musical differences and gone their separate ways. Uh, so, uh, I, I, there are... The, one of the problems with this with this market is that there is no there are no regulators, there are no equalising mechanisms. Uh, there, there is it's 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 the purest kind of free market in the world with very very limited protections for for anyone else, uh, and the barriers to entry are extremely high. It's very difficult to become a a a, um, a, uh, a key member of the uh, of, of the ICC. So I can't see any sort of countervailing forces to uh, to India's power being introduced. Uh, and of course, it's now got the uh, the, uh, the the further impetus of uh, a nationalist government in India, which is joined at the hip to to the to the BCCI, which which further enhances the uh, the BCCI stature, almost turns it into an arm of the state. Uh, as far as the Olympics is concerned, I can't really see it making all that much difference. What they're proposing so far is is a pretty small scale uh, additional cricket tournament because you know that's exactly what cricket needs, isn't it? Another bloody tournament. Uh, this one arguably a little bit more important and significant than others, but one which will vanish very, very quickly down the memory hole. And who knows what the world will look like by the time cricket is played in the Olympics. It's changing so fast now, it's almost impossible to see what's going to be happening next week. But Gideon, in the Olympics, it's only six teams, with America one of them, is T20. So I don't think it's going to have a major impact on world cricket. And yeah. as somebody said, it's the Olympics which needs cricket, not cricket needing the Olympics. <laughs>